Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, we're glad you're here with us today. The rose on the communion table today is in celebration of the birth of Finnick Andrew Fletcher, son of Jesse and Jacqueline Fletcher, first grandchild of Becca and Tim Fletcher, and eighth great-grandchild of Peggy Klein. And today is Grocery Cart Sunday, so the kids will be pushing the grocery carts during offering if you've brought donations for the White Bear Food Shelf today. The Let's Give Party is coming up on Sunday, December 3rd after worship. We'll be collecting items to donate to several charities, including Souls for Souls, The Closet, Solid Ground, NAMI, and the White Bear Food Shelf. Please see our church website for items that we'll be collecting and bring them on December 3rd for this event. A Red Cross blood drive will be hosted by FPC on Thursday, December 14th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, fill out one of the blue cards located in the pews. You may put the card in the offering plate when we pass the plates and the ushers will give your prayer request to Pastor Neil. And now, a moment for mission from Brad Crooks. Good morning. So as of Saturday at noon, we have received 46 pledges for $185,200. If you're one of those 46, thank you for your commitment to the church and you can tune me out for the next minute or so. So I'll be honest, I've been really busy with work this week. So busy that I didn't get a chance to write this moment of permission until the last minute. And that got me thinking that we're getting close to the last minute for our stewardship campaign. So this Tuesday session will meet and one of the items on the agenda will be to discuss our budget for the next year. It will help us greatly if we have an idea of what our income for next year will be. And as you know, the way we do this is to look at how much has been pledged and along with some other factors. Uh, now for the complete honesty. As I mentioned earlier, I've been very busy with work. And in fact, I've been so busy lately that I haven't had time to turn in my pledge for next year. I know I'm standing up here and I'm asking you to turn in your pledges when I haven't done it myself, but luckily there is still time. And I'm going to talk to Mike right after church today and get mine in. So if you're like me and have just been really busy and haven't had time to get your pledge in and it's been on the back burner, I urge you to make time to do that. It really does make a difference. Thank you. a couple of batteries from you here in a minute or two uh, during that first hymn. Um, you did, Brad, you, you, you did get Mike's email from session, obviously, then this week saying if session members haven't got their pledges in, it's time. Um, so at least you're reading Mike's email, so I appreciate that. Uh, you guys are also sitting out there on some wonderful blankets today. Uh, we had folks here making those blankets yesterday, and Carla tells me we I made about 90 blankets that are going to be distributed then over the coming weeks to the Marie Sandvik Center and, um, you know, the, the, g providing the gift of warmth and heat. And that's part of our stewardship as well, right? It's not just all about the money. We need the financial stewardship piece, but we also need to be engaged in the community with our time, our talents, and our energy and our gifts. So a big thank you to everyone who was here yesterday and a part of that and to Carla for uh, once again heading that up for us as well. I would really appreciate that. Uh, I don't think it was in the announcements this morning, so just a reminder that next Sunday there is no Sunday school. It's a holiday weekend, so uh, we'll be gathering for worship at 1015, but we won't be having anything prior to that. As we come to worship this morning, we do so as God's people. Uh, we are a community of faith gathered together here in this space. We call ourselves the First Presbyterian Church of White Bear Lake but we also call ourselves Christians. We call ourselves Christ followers, the people of God, the family of God. And as we come to worship, we declare that Jesus is Lord, 
but he is our king. And so I invite you as you're able to stand as we sing together our opening hymn, number 139, Come, Thou Almighty King. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, We confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. This time we take a moment to bring our offerings before God. And that might be a financial offering as the food carts are passed and you pass your food to the center aisle. It might be a food offering. You might be placing a prayer request into the offering plates today on one of the blue cards. Or as you touch the plates, you might just be offering a prayer of thanks to God for all that we have been blessed with. Oh. 
everything that we have. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of our, all the talents that you have entrusted to us, that we might be faithful stewards of our gifts, our time, our talents, our energy, as we seek to build your kingdom here and throughout this world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and while the adults are grabbing a seat, if any kids want to come and join Shara up here, we would love to have you. Good morning. All right. I'm going to throw out some have you ever stories. So this is like, have you ever had these feelings before? And if you have felt these feelings before, raise your hand, okay? Have you ever had a long day at school or just a long day in general and you came home and you felt tired? Have you ever? All right. Have you ever had a conversation or talked to friends or family or someone that you meet and um, you think that what they're saying is nonsense and it makes you feel worked up? Okay. Have you ever woken up and maybe because you didn't have enough sleep or for whatever reason, you're grumpy? Okay, have you ever um, had something happen where someone said something that wasn't nice or something happened where you just felt sad, maybe overwhelmed, stressed? Well, good news, you're just like Jesus because Jesus felt the same way because like us, Jesus was human and there are these great little sections of the Bible where Jesus is in front of these huge crowds of people, and he has spent all day talking to these to people. And they've come up and they've asked him for help, and they've asked him for support, and they've asked him for prayers, and they've asked him for food, and they've asked him so many questions. And he's surrounded by the people. And he's, he'll go somewhere to try and, you know, pray quietly. And then people are everywhere. Do you think if you were surrounded by people nonstop, that you'd feel a little tired and exhausted from time to time? You'd feel overwhelmed, yes. And I can assume Jesus felt the same way because there are these little sections in the Bible that says, Jesus went away to a lonely place to be alone. He was recharging. We all need that, right? And it can be encouraging to know that even Jesus felt that. But what's great to know is Jesus was a good example because Jesus didn't have these crowds of people around him and all of a sudden he's like, leave me alone, or said something mean. Get out of my face. Or Jesus weren't surra wasn't surrounded by a bunch of people and then he just shoved him out of his way because he was like tired or they were grabbing at him and he didn't want that. No, he was, he was our example of what you should do. Take a deep breath and say to whoever you're with, I gotta get out of here for a few minutes. And then find a quiet place if you need to be alone with your thoughts, right? If you need to pray, if you need to breathe, if you need to practice mindfulness. So that's a great e example for us. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. That is human and you will. But don't react in a way that's gonna hurt others. If you can, find your quiet spot and recharge, just like Jesus did. Can we pray together? Dear Lord, sometimes it's hard to be human. And Jesus knew exactly how that felt. Thank you for his example of going away quietly and recharging. Help us to give our best to others and take care of ourselves. And all God's children said, amen. Please join me in singing number 316, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
The scripture for today is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 40 to 44, and chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. It's that time of year now, isn't it, when things start to ramp up towards Christmas. We've got Thanksgiving coming up this Thursday. Cool 108 has already started its 24 hours of Christmas music, and they started that like a week ago or more now. Um, I don't know why they start so early, but um, some people love it, I guess. I know that come Thanksgiving, um, at least two members of our family are going to be demanding that the moment we finish eating the meal that we're putting Christmas decorations up, in fact, they've already started decorating behind my back a little bit. There's lights up at the front of the house now, um, and I'm not sure what's going on there. We're moving into what is then a holiday season. And I want to encourage all of us as we enter a holiday season to slow down a little bit. To think about reintegrating our lives as we remember the purpose behind the days that lie ahead. These are holidays. These are holy days. And they really are that. They are holy days. Thanksgiving itself was originally a holy day, a day with deep religious sentiment, and that was soon then followed by the season of Advent, the season of Advent marks the start of the liturgical calendar, the start of a new year for Christians. Advent being 24 holy days that leads us up to the celebration of the coming Messiah. Something that in the early church people looked forward to, not because they would celebrate the birth of Jesus, but they looked forward with great anticipation to the time when Christ would return and fully consummate the kingdom of God. We're entering into a season of holy days. And as we enter into a season of holy days, we really should pause and reflect on how we're going to prepare to celebrate them. And yet we all know all too well that these next few weeks can create all kinds of stress in our lives. Right? It's that time of year again when we sit down through family conversations and we talk about how much money each family unit is going to spend on each nephew or niece in the family because 
We don't want to create a scenario where one family unit outdoes another family unit, at which point I find myself sitting there wondering to myself, why don't we just give them cash to go buy whatever the heck they want? Because we're going to give them a gift receipt anyway, and they're probably going to return it and get what they want anyway, and it would just save a lot of, a lot of headaches if we could just do that kind of thing. Last year for Christmas, I told Michaela I wanted nothing. And somehow she find it a way, found out a creative way to get something that was actually nothing, but that nothing was a something. Um, and so if you ever want to see what nothing looks like, I have a book about nothing, and I have, um, also have um, a, a, a gift that is nothing. So if you ask me that, it's in my office. You can see that if you'd like to see that later. You know, or what happens when you get to that dis family discussion time about, you know, what, what, what age should we, should we stop buying gifts for the kids for? And one uncle and aunt wants to keep buying, and another doesn't want to do that. Or we're trying to schedule, you know, we're trying to schedule everybody's schedules together to get multiple family units to meet at the same time. And, you know, what are we going to eat? And if we're going to eat together, who's going to bring what that we need to eat in that meal setting? Um, oh, gosh, then when are we going to find time to go shopping? Thank goodness for Amazon. But what if they don't like the gift that we get and we start stressing about whether or not that gift is something they'll like? Breathe. Slow down. Pause. Learn something from Jesus. In that text that Laura read for us, Jesus had just had a very full and busy day. It was the Sabbath day. He'd begun his day at the synagogue. And as he was at the synagogue, he was invited to teach. So he spent his morning teaching at the synagogue. After which he restores a man who had a demon in him. Demon in him. And then he goes to the, um, Peter's, the house of Peter's mother-in-law where she has a fever and he heals her. And word gets out that Jesus is at this house and people start bringing all the sick and all the lame, all the demon possessed to him. And he spends his day bringing healing and wholeness to them right up to the time at which the sun is setting. Which is actually quite an interesting observation because it means it's still the Sabbath. And you think about all the trouble that Jesus got into on occasion for healing on the Sabbath. And now he's healing person after person after person. Everyone who is dealing with every kind of issue is showing up and looking to be healed. I can imagine the crowds beginning to form at the door of Simon or Peter's mother-in-law's house. And the expectation is heavy on Jesus because the expectation is that Jesus can heal them all. The expectation is that Jesus will restore them all, make them all whole again. And certainly Jesus is capable of doing that. He could get up the next morning and jump right back into it, couldn't he? He could spend day after day after day doing this, helping people. The people would appreciate it. He, it would be a win-win situation, wouldn't it? Everybody would be happy. Jesus could perform miracles. He could be everybody's superhero. The people would love him. Or would that be the best thing? Apparently not. Because it's daybreak the next morning. And Jesus, Jesus is nowhere to be found. Jesus has got up and left. He's headed off to a solitary place. He wants to be. He needs to be alone. Jesus needed to find space to slow down. To pause to remember that even though there were plenty of good things that he could be doing, his calling and purpose wasn't to solve every problem. His calling and purpose wasn't to heal every person. His calling and purpose wasn't to cast out every demon. And if he had got caught up in that moment, it would have become a distraction from his mission to preach the good news and to proclaim that the kingdom of God had come near. So even though the people eventually track him down and find him in this solitary place, interrupting his time alone, and then they try to keep him from leaving them, 
But Jesus had still found enough time to breathe. He'd found enough space in which to slow down, being able to once again focus on his mission and purpose for being there. So he's able to say, no, it's time now to move on to other villages and let them know that the kingdom of God is here. When life got busy, when the expectations and the demands of people piled up, when stress levels were building, what did Jesus do? Did he pack his schedule with more because he could? No. Did he try to implement the latest time management system that was being put out? No, because they didn't have such things back then. What Jesus did was he walked away. He took time for himself. He slowed down. Folks, if Jesus needed to slow down, if Jesus needed to get away to a solitary place in order to reconnect, how much more do we need to take time out of our own schedule sometimes to do the same thing? The pace of life in the first century was walking pace. Jesus walked everywhere. When I was on sabbatical at the start of this year, the Sunday school uh, morning adult ed class spent some time going um, through a curriculum called Godspeed. And in that curriculum, one of the concepts, one of the ideas that comes out of it is the idea of a three-mile-an-hour God, the average walking pace of a human. When God came to us in Jesus, the time in history that best suited God's purposes for accomplishing redemption in this world was a time when people moved slowly through life. It was a three-day trip for Jesus and the disciples to move from Galilee down to Jerusalem. So to go to Jerusalem for a day and then go back to Galilee, that would have been a full week to take care of that. Just last Wednesday, Michaela came home from Rochester uh, for a concert before heading back to Rochester the next morning. In a couple of hours, she was able to cover the journey that would have taken a week back then. It takes me less time to travel from Minnesota to Belfast, a journey that just 150 years or so ago would have taken several months. It takes me now less than a day. Folks, if we can save so much time, then surely we have plenty of time for all that matters, right? How is it then that we don't? How is it then that we're so rushed? How is it that we're so stressed? How is it that we're living these lives of disintegration, struggling to keep ourselves together at times? Leo Tolstoy, he found great success in life. His books sold tremendously during his own lifetime, and he made great wealth from them. He wrote a really short little book called uh, A Confession. And in his confession, he talks about how he had it all. He had a good wife. He had good children. He had a large estate. He was someone who was highly respected by his peers. He had fame and he had fortune. And yet, in spite of all that, in spite of having everything the world offered, he said there was one thing that continued to push him to the verge of suicide. And it was this, and this is how he phrased it, is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? Is there anything, any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy. And so Tolstoy went on a quest for meaning and purpose in life. And what he found was that most of his peers, they weren't even looking. They were so consumed with their day-to-day -day revelry and accumulation of wealth and possessions 
that they actually had no time for the ultimate questions of importance in life. They became entirely self-indulgent and so distracted from any quest for the meaning of purpose in their lives. And unfortunately, this is how it so often is today. Many people in positions of power are even counting on us being distracted from it. They encourage you not to think about anything beyond your own selfish self-interest. Eventually, Tolstoy would turn his attention to Jesus. And as he turned his attention to Jesus, he became aware that there was a great contradiction between the so-called faith of his wealthy friends and the faith of the peasants in Russia who were struggling just to survive on a daily basis. And he wrote, those who do God's will, the simple, unlearned working folk, whom we regard as cattle, do not reproach the master, but we, the wise, eat the master's food, but do not do what the master wishes. What a powerful thought. And I wonder how often do we fail to follow Jesus simply because we get into such a hurry. Simply because we get too busy, we get caught up in all the things of the world that we fail to slow down, we fail to take time to listen, we fail to reintegrate our lives with God's will for this world. We'll take Jesus, yes, but we'll only take Jesus when it's on our terms. We'll only take Jesus when we get the Jesus we want to mold and to shape into our own image and likeness rather than allowing ourselves to be molded by God's Spirit once again into the image and likeness of Jesus. When Jesus could have been distracted in his ministry, when the needs of the world were pressing in literally at the door of the home that he was staying in, he headed off to a solitary place. He headed off into the wilderness to get away from the crowds. And he doesn't just do this one time. Rather, we're told he does this frequently. As we heard after another event with the crowds, he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. If Jesus needed that time away to reconnect when life was lived at a much slower pace, how much more do we need that today? We are at the beginning of a season of slowing down. Fall is transitioning to winter. The days are shorter. The nights are growing longer. The land has gone dormant. It is now sitting at rest. This is a season in which nature pulls everything inward to protect itself from the coming cold. This is a season that is designed with self-reflection, looking inward and contemplation in mind. This is a season to withdraw from the crowd to a solitary, still, wild place. A season to soak in the very presence of God. To find that internal renewal that we all so desperately need. And yes, we've destroyed the rhythm of the seasons in the northern hemisphere through electric lights and other modern conveniences like, like um, heating systems which we're very thankful for, by the way. But we need to allow ourselves to rest. We need to allow ourselves to have space, space for prayer, space to reconnect with God. As we enter into this season of holy days, let's make sure that we stay connected with God. It's going to be so easy to get swept up in the distractions and the distresses that the world wants to throw our way. And so I simply invite you to breathe deeply, to breathe slowly, to breathe in the spirit 
of God and to be like Jesus and frequently find solitary places, time alone, spaces where you can just be with God in prayer and reconnect yourself with Jesus and the God who loves us so much. Let us pray together. Lord, this is a week in which we are looking forward to spending time with friends and family gathered around a table, celebrating and giving thanks. And I pray, Lord, that we might indeed be able to give thanks. But Lord, as we give thanks together, help us to be mindful of those who go without this time of year. For those who are homeless on the streets, for those who struggle with questions of food security and don't necessarily know where their next meal is coming from then. Help us, Lord, not to get so caught up in the, this season of busyness that we forget the pain and the hurt of, in the world that others face as well. We're grateful that you are the God who is with us. And we want to offer prayers of thanks, Lord, for Mary Wakeham, who had been hospitalized this week and is now back home from the hospital uh, recovering. But we do pray, Lord, too, that as she continues to struggle with low hemoglobin levels, that the doctors might be able to find out what is causing that for her at this time. We also want to offer prayer, Lord, for Yvonne Schultz, who was hospitalized this past week as well. And we're grateful that she is now home recovering. And we just pray, Lord, for her continued healing. And hopefully, Lord, she will be back uh, in her favorite spot, singing with the choir again before too long. And Lord, we also want to offer prayer for Dave Johnson's niece's baby, um, as uh, that baby is now home from the hospital and doing well, and we are grateful for that. We pray, Lord, that mother and child would continue uh, their recovery process and be restored to full health here before too long as well. Lord, last Sunday we were praying for Dave and Sue Hunt. Um, brother-in-law Terry and the surgery that he was facing. And we just are thankful that that surgery went well and that he is now home recovering. We pray that um, that healing would continue um, and that health would be fully restored here before too long. Lord, you are the God who is with us. You are the God who is here this morning. You're the God that we name in Jesus Christ and seek to follow each day of our lives. And so, Lord, with one voice, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we conclude our time of worship this morning, I would invite you to stand and, as you're able and make this final song a prayer as we sing together as the deer. As the deer painted for the water, so long as after thee, you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. You
do hope you're able to stay and join us for a cup of coffee and spend a little more time with one another in community this morning. If you are heading straight out of here today, I hope you have a fabulous Thanksgiving and are able to spend some time with friends and family this week and uh, just celebrate the gift of relationship. In fact, even if you're staying, I hope you're able to do that as well. Uh, so I uh, hope that, wish that for all of you this morning. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in you now and evermore. Go forth in peace. And God's people said, Amen.